the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be always acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> my friend Phyllis was an acolyte at the cathedral in Albuquerque, New Mexico, when she was a young teenager. Like many cathedrals, that cathedral had a lot of Sunday morning services, and it was hard to talk acolytes into staying for the last service of the morning at 11 a.m. So Phyllis decided she would just recruit a whole bunch of new acolytes who would serve at that service in particular. On the day that they would have their first trial run, they were very nervous, and so she said to them, just follow me. If I stand, stand. If I sit, sit. If I kneel, kneel. Well, the service was going really well until Phyllis began to feel faint. <laughs> and so she sat down and put her head between her knees. And when the feeling passed, she sat up and looked around, and all of the acolytes were sitting with their head between their knees. Follow me. We are still in the first chapter of Mark's Gospel, the beginning of his ministry. And two weeks ago, he called the disciples with the words, follow me. And then immediately, they left their nets and their boats and their families and followed him. Last week, Jesus entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and healed. Today, we hear the story of one 24-hour time period in the life of Jesus. It is a one-day practicum in leadership, discipleship, and following. The day began at the synagogue, where Jesus and the disciples would have heard scripture and worshiped and prayed. Mark described the beginning of that time period succinctly after Jesus and his disciples left the synagogue. Dot, dot, dot. Then Jesus began to work. He entered the home of Peter, where he learned that Peter's mother-in-law was not well. He went to her bedside and healed her. People began coming to Peter's home. The whole city came to Peter's home. They were sick, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Jesus worked. He healed, cast out demons, restored people to the fullness of their being. We don't know how many hours he worked that day or how many people he touched. Mark didn't give us quantifiable productivity analysis. Instead, he said that after all the healings, long before the sun rose, Jesus went to a deserted place and prayed. And that was the conclusion of a 24-hour period in the life of Jesus the Christ. It began in a setting much like this, in community, listening to God's word and praising God. And it concluded alone, in prayer. St. Christopher's adult Sunday school class begins a new curriculum today. For the next six weeks, we will read the Gospel of Mark deeply, finding examples of discipleship as we go. When we finish with Mark, we'll read a book written by Richard Foster, titled Celebration of Discipline, The Path to Spiritual Growth. The first section of Foster's book addresses what he calls the inward disciplines meditation, prayer, fasting, and study. The second section is titled The Outward Disciplines, Simplicity, Solitude, Submission, and Service. Foster says these outward disciplines are manifestations, revelations of the inward disciplines. So last week, I was preparing our Sunday school curriculum and at the same time working on today's sermon. And so Richard Foster's reflections on discipleship were kind of front and center in my mind. I began to see this story about the healing of Peter's mother-in-law through the lens of Jesus' discipleship. The first thing I noticed, Jesus' days were rooted in his relationship with God. Whether that meant walking into a synagogue with a bunch of buddies, into a desert, or to a high place, he began each day with God. Prayer is one of his inward disciplines. The second thing that popped out to me was the outward discipline of service. 
Foster said a serving heart is a reflection of our inner spiritual discipline, like prayer. In Mark's story, the people who came to Peter's house for healing came after sundown because the story takes place on the Sabbath. The crowd came after the sunset when they were not violating the rules of their religion. Jesus healed them after the Sabbath, except Peter's mother-in-law. Jesus healed her on the Sabbath. The actions of the characters in this story reveal their understanding of what Jesus meant when he said, follow me. The disciples left their boats and followed Jesus. They went where he went. But when Jesus went to the desert to pray early in the morning, the disciples were still tucked in bed sleeping. When they woke up, he was gone, and they didn't know where he had, went, where he had gone. And that is the point in the story when I hear my mother's voice saying, Paula, you had one job. He said to follow him. Eventually, of course, they find Jesus, and he's praying. He waited for them. There's no tone of judgment in his greeting. He doesn't say, what took you so long to find me, or hey guys, you had the one job. Jesus knew the disciples did not yet understand that following him was not about finding his footprints in the sand and stepping into them. Following meant seeing the deliberateness of his life, how his life was rooted in God's life, how he practiced discipleship, and how his life revealed his calling. There is one character in this story who immediately recognizes Jesus' discipleship and follows, Peter's mother-in-law. She was ill. On the Sabbath, Jesus broke the rules of this world and healed her. On the Sabbath, she broke the rules of this world and served Jesus and the others in the household. Jesus did not say to her, follow me, but she did. At the end of Mark's gospel, Jesus gives a commission to the disciples and now to us in our time. Go into all the world and proclaim the good news, the good news of resurrection, the good news of God's redeeming love for you and me. There are plenty of followers in this world. There are people who follow social media as if it was gospel. There are people who follow politicians, movie stars, sports stars. And of course, there are people in every age who will follow someone, anyone, over a cliff. To be a follower of Jesus requires us to be discerning. We have to choose what goes into our minds and our hearts and our bodies because all of it affects what we proclaim to the world through our lives. Someone is following your witness of Christ today. Where are you leading them? Amen. Amen.